So today uh, we we may begin our lecture by talking a little bit about the problem sheet number two. But let me just briefly remind you that there is another problem sheet already out, problem sheet number three. I'm going to share my screen and walk you through it. So here's the third problem sheet. Uh, it's basically all about calculating the Levi Civita symbol, the, the Christopher symbols and the Levi Civita connection, and a simple exercise on transforming the metric into new coordinates. Okay, but before that, let's go back to problem sheet number two. So thank you very much for your solutions to that problem sheet. Uh, they were all okay, although not perfect. The first problem is relatively simple. Uh, the idea is that we are supposed to rederive the uh, Maxwell's the remaining Maxwell's equations from uh, this form uh, when they're expressed using the Faraday tensor. So let's try to do it now. I will share my screen. I will share the breadboard. On... So it's problem sheet two. So the problem one was to derive the Maxwell's equation from this form of the equations. What we have here is a cyclic permutation of all three indices, alpha, beta, beta, and the mu, nu, and the differentiation index alpha. And we just take all three cyclic uh, permutations. We take three cyclic permutations of that. Now, if you remember, the upper index Faraday tensor was basically an antisymmetric tensor consisting of the electric and of the magnetic field. Minus E3. And here we have minus B3, B2, minus B1. So the first task is simply to derive the lower index versions of this of this tensor, let's say F mu nu. It turns out that all you need to do is simply to swap the signs uh, of the electric field components. So we have zero minus E1 minus E2 minus E3, E1, E2, E3, zero, 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 B3 minus B2, B1 minus B1, B2, B3. Uh, and now there is a couple of components we there's a there's a couple of types of components we might calculate here so let's begin with the situation when any of these two indices are repeated for example it can be f zero zero alpha plus f uh, zero alpha zero plus f alpha zero zero equals to zero well this is zero because of the antisymmetry, and these two guys cancel each other out exactly because of the antisymmetry in the first two indices. So this is identically correct, identically true. Uh, in many types of exercises, we'll be very happy to find out that this type of relation is true, but here it simply means that there is no uh, equations on E or U from this part from these components of those equations over here. Which means that we have to, that the only non-vanished, the, the only proper equations, we can, on, we can get proper equations only if we take three different indices, indices here. Uh, okay, let's go to the next layer.
So let's take F01 two plus F one two O plus F O uh, no that was already here F two O one equal to zero. Uh, going back to the previous equation, what we see is that F01, that's this one. So it's minus E1. F12, that's, let's check it. One, two, that's B2 over here. Two or three? One, two. Sorry, it should be three here. It cannot be two. My mistake. B3, zero, and here we get E2, one. Let's check that once again. Uh, F2, zero is just E2. Okay. And we get, from the rest of these equations, we also get E minus E3, one plus B two zero. That's the rest of the equations. Uh, zero, one, three, and zero, two, three components. From, the, from those components, we get plus E one, three equals to zero and minus E two, three plus B three zero plus E three two equals to zero. And these equations, it's easy to straightforward to check that they're just simply equivalent to DB over DT, because T is zero plus the curl of E equals to zero. So that's the three equations you get from mu, mu alpha equal to zero, one, three, zero, two, three. Um, by the way, any permutations of those will lead to the same equation, maybe with a different sign. So we are in the end only left with the mu, mu alpha equal to one, two, three. And here's what we get, F one, two, three, plus F two, three, one plus F three one two. And that's basically B three over three. We have already checked that. Plus uh, B one one plus B two two equals to zero. And that's basically divergence B equals to zero. That's the remaining equation. So yeah. Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then we can go to the next uh, problem. Not that many people tried the next problem, but some did. Uh, nobody got the answer exactly right, but some people were not very far off. So let me show the next problem. The next problem is the relativistic beaming paradox. So we have a massive source, which is emitting isotropically light. It can have some kind of non-zero temperature and simply emits electromagnetic radiation um, according to the Planck distribution. The emission is isotropic in its inertial rest frame, but we consider what happens when we look at the situation in a boosted frame, also inertial. In that case, the radiation would appear anisotropic, meaning that the energy would be very much collimated in the direction of propagation of the body. We talked about this effect. The uh, that's the relativistic beaming. 
And that means that the relativistic radiation emitted by S has a non-vanishing net momentum in one direction, the direction of the velocity. But if it is so, then it means that the electromagnetic radiation carries away momentum in an, an isotropic way. This means that there must be some kind of net force uh, balancing that acting on the body S because of the momentum conservation. A, a bit like a rocket, right? Uh, it emits electromagnetic radiation mostly in one direction. So S should appear some kind of drag-like force because of that. But that would be very strange because we know that, first of all, we don't see any force like that when we analyze the problem uh, in, the, uh, in the rest mass of, of our body. Uh, so this is incompatible very much with special relativity. Uh, and secondly, this force actually depends very much on the velocity in which, on, on the inertial frame in which we're looking at, the, uh, at this problem. So we have a paradox. And the idea is that we are supposed to resolve this paradox. So let's go back to the blackboard. Okay, that's problem two. Okay, so let's try to draw a picture of this situation. This will be X, this is CT, and this will be the rest frame of our body. So here's the word line of our body, this blue one. And we know that this body is con continuously emitting radiation. Let's say we use this reddish color. in a completely isotropic way. All the time, basically. Yeah, so we fix some short period of time delta t. And in this period of time, uh, let this be some kind of T. This was correspond to T plus delta T. Uh, PS mu is the momentum of our body. So PS mu of T from the energy and momentum conservation is the, uh, this body form, uh, form momentum at the time delta T plus everything that has been carried away by photons. So I will sum I write it as a sum of all photons of the form momentum of each photon. Sorry. Pi mu. And we know that Pi mu, Pi mu is zero. These are all photons. And we also know that the emission is isotropic. So Pi is the Pi correspond to the form correspond I corresponds to all photons that have been emitted between moment T and moment T plus delta T. So this sum over here, the spatial part of that is supposed to be zero because this is entirely isotropic. So there is no spatial momentum here. However, there's a non-trivial equation for the uh, energy. Energy at T is equal to energy at T plus delta T plus the sum of energies of all photons. Uh, yeah, so we can write it a bit differently, minus the power of the emission times delta T. That's basically energy at T plus delta T minus energy at T. That's the sum of energies of all bodies. So we find out that the energy is consistently decreasing because of the energy carried away by the photons, which is not surprising. But what is really important here is that uh, uh, okay, let's define it with a plus here. So E of T is equal to, sorry. E of T plus delta T is equal to E of T minus P 
delta T. So that's the energy emitted. Okay, but what is really important to realize is that the mass of this body, as it is moving, uh, as the time is progressing, is also changing. Because recall that the rest mass is just the energy at the rest frame. And this energy is actually time dependent. So uh, M0 of T plus delta T, the mass um, a moment later of this body is equal to the mass at T minus P dot delta T. We've got the fundamental relation that at the rest frame, the proper mass is just the energy and the energy is decreasing. So the mass is also decreasing. But other than that, nothing really interesting happens here. So let's look at that in the boosted frame. So this is a boosted frame. X prime CT prime. And now the body appears to be moving with a constant velocity. Let's also draw the photons, photons. Let's say, I'll make it here. But the thing is that the energy is mostly emitted in this direction with relatively little emitted here. So there's a big concentration of photons here and very few over there. Okay. Let's go back here. Uh, Professor, I had one question. Can I ask? Yes, sure. So the thing is that these are not the uh, like the lines for photons, right? No, because these they, are not. These, these are lines are, of photons. These are lines of photons, but this is a three D picture. Okay. Uh, uh -huh, imagine okay. that there's a third axis here. Let's say Y prime. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is, this is supposed to represent the photons along the whole light cone, except that they tend to gather uh, in this re region here. Okay, let me make a little better picture. Now, it's, hopefully it will be a little better. So this is basically the light cone. Ah, okay. With a big concentration of photons over here. Okay, okay. Thanks for the question. This okay. might have been not that clear. Okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, obviously there's a relation for every vector. Basically, uh, for every vector we have, uh, also just for the momentum, for the momentum of the word line, we have that P for the momentum P mu prime is equal to, and here we have a matrix. Yes, mu and the matrix is gamma, uh, gamma v, gamma v, gamma zero 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 one one. So this is a boost along the x line. We, in the same way, we can boost the photons of uh, the, the, the four moment of the photons, and we quickly find out that this time. The spatial part does not vanish. So there is indeed net momentum transfer uh, to the photons. Okay, but let's try to calculate what this transfer is. Uh, Pi mu prime is equal to, let's call this lambda, lambda mu prime mu sum of i. P, I, mu. So each of these guys transforms in the same way. So we can take the tr transformation matrix uh, out of that. Uh, yeah. And this was, if you remember correctly, the total sum of these four velocities, that was basically P delta T. So the, the energy emitted within time delta T, zero, zero, zero.
Uh, and if you perform the transformation, this is just T delta T gamma gamma V zero zero. Okay. So indeed, there seems to be a, if we divide by delta T, we may think that there is indeed a force in the sense that within time delta T, we have taken this minus P. There must be a reaction force acting on the body which counters this, this loss of form momentum in time delta t. And this indeed has a spatial component, uh, a negative one, so it corresponds to drag. But does it really lead to a de decrease of acceleration? Well, you might be tempting simply to write that m0 d u mu of a detail, the, the, uh, the equation of motion for this luminous body is simply this force here, but that's not quite correct. Do you see why? Well, we have shown that this body is actually losing mass cons constantly. And for bodies which lose mass, the equation of motion looks a little different. Namely, basically what we have is that d over d tau of the mo momentum of this body, which is d over d tau, the proper time, m0 u mu, which is the first term which we know. If the mass were conserved, this would be it. But if it is not, then there is another term here, dm0 over d tau, corresponding to the loss of mass. And this must be equal, sorry, this is all prime. And this must be equal to this force over here, p gamma gamma v zero zero. Okay. If you have ever analyzed uh, how a rocket engine works and what are the equations of motions of a rocket taking off from the earth, uh, then you might recognize this type of reasoning. You also have to consider what happens when your uh, rocket is losing mass consistently because of its rocket engine. So there is an additional term here, okay? And now, this is layer number five. And now if you calculate it, d over d tau m0, in fact, we have calculated that, uh, that's basically minus p delta t, right? Because, sorry, it's simply minus p. Uh, this is because we have calculated that the rate of change of m0 is the rate of change of energy and then energy decreases with the power minus p. And then when we take this all together, what we obtain is minus p. So let's go back to the equation over here. Uh, we leave this guy. Um, So we have m0 d u mu prime over d tau, the standard acceleration term, but on top of that, we've got minus p. Uh, and here we have momentary for velocity of this body. And this is equal to the force, which is minus p gamma gamma v zero zero. But this is also gamma gamma v zero zero the four moment the four velocity of this body so this guys cancels out this one and we have the equation of motion d u mu prime over d tau equals to zero so good it means that despite this momentum transfer uh, from the body to the electromagnetic field to the photons there is no change of velocity in the end why because look uh, I will paint the four momentum of this body over here. This thing is losing four momentum, which means that the whole four momentum vector is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, although still pointing in the same direction. But if it is so, then 
something must take this for momentum and carry it away, both the energy part and also the momentum part. And that's very good. It turns out that the, the, this outflow, outflow of photons actually balances this extremely well. Uh, the excess of photons in the right direction takes care of the shortening of the uh, for momentum vector of the luminous body and the loss of, of the spatial part. And the energy of all these photons takes care of the uh, excess energy, which has to be radiated away. So the, the for momentum is getting shorter and shorter. The velocity is constant and everything is fine. In a sense, there is a force in the sense that there is a net momentum, that transfer of the momentum, spatial momentum to the electromagnetic field, but it does not cause any acceleration because this is a body with uh, variable mass. And this transfer only cancels the variable mass term. Is this explanation clear? Uh, I had some doubts in it. Can I ask? Okay. Yes, sure. So the first thing is that, yeah, these equations are very similar to the rocket propulsion equation. But That's then right. if we are talking about loss of mass, then it there can also be a period where the mass can go lower than the rest mass, which is not going to be possible, right? No. And the answer is very simple. Uh, physical systems cannot radiate energy uh, uh, cannot radiate all of their energy and why. There's only some energy which is available uh, and the emission cannot go on forever. Yeah, that energy is going to be the kinetic energy, right? Uh, no, no, it's, 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 it's M0. It's the, it's the energy of the system. It's not just the kinetic energy. Can, look, kinetic energy is a notion which is very much uh, frame dependent. What is not frame dependent is the proper mass, right? Yes. And the, and the proper mass, when you're radiating energy, the proper mass is decreasing very slowly. This is a, a very slow process because look, if you if you add the, uh, if you if if you add c square as as and, and, and use this equation with proper units, you'll see that the decrease of mass because of the decrease of energy is very small, almost non non measurable. However, it does exist. What it means is that this cannot go forever. You can only lose as many energy to electromagnetic radiation as, as you have your proper mass and not more. This cannot last forever and doesn't last forever for physical bodies either. They, they lose, the temperature goes down, uh, the emission power also decreases very quickly with time and that's it. They typically lose very small fraction of their total mass. Yeah, but in uh, the rest frame, we will see this how? How are we going to see this? I mean, there's nothing interesting happening in the rest frame. It's just that the mass is slowly decreasing, decreasing, and there's just radiation going away isotropically. Okay, it's because of the radiation as uh, like the mass is decreasing, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. So the energy is decreasing by this rate, but the energy is proper mass in this in this frame. So the mass is decreasing exactly at the same rate. Uh, okay. There should be no dot here, sorry. I keep making mistakes on the blackboard. There should, there's no dot here. It's just the, the power times delta t. Uh, because I was also thinking that <clears throat> what if there is a proton which is going to be there uh, mm -hmm. and it's in an accelerated frame of reference, right? So in that scenario, the proton will start radiating, whereas in rest frame, it won't. Um, it doesn't work this way. Okay, this is very okay. much beyond this lecture, but no, it will not start radiating just out, out of nothing. Okay. Uh, accelerating rest frame is not equivalent to uh, to an inertial frame. That's a very yeah, different yeah, yeah, of animal. Course. Of course. Okay. Uh, but what? is it in similar lines? That is what I wanted to ask. Uh, what is similar? So, for example, if we have a proton in an accelerated frame of reference, mm -hmm. will we also approach that kind of problem in this similar fashion? Or is uh, there no, no, you'd have to solve the Maxwell's equations with uh, with a particle. So, from the classical physics perspective, you'd have to solve the Maxwell's equations with a particle. Doing this in an accelerated frame is rather painful. You would not do it. You would simply go to the non-accelerating frame and just realize that in this case the field is actually 
trivially simple, and that's it. And maybe transform it back. Solving it, okay. solving the Maxwell's equations in non initial frame is unpleasant to say the very least, and not advisable. Okay, thank they you. They look differently and much worse. Okay, uh, so that's th this is the homework part. And now we will go back to the lecture. So just to remind you, uh, in the last lecture, we, we were discussing the connection and the and the Christoffel symbols, the metric connection. And we were, yeah, and we were calculating the, let's go to the next layer. Mm -hmm. Layer six. Ah, uh, sorry. That's layer six. Now it can be seven, not a problem. Okay, coefficient. So we are back at calculating the Christoffel symbols. For the met for the metric, let me remind you this metric. Uh, minus the t squared one minus one plus two phi of x i. This is x y z plus dx squared dy squared dz squared. And here we have a different coefficient two phi x i. So yeah, and on top of the inverse metric has components minus one over one plus two phi and g i i being one minus one minus two phi. Okay, and we were calculating the Christoffel symbols. We calculated a lot of them. The only one that is missing right now is, if I remember correctly, gamma one, one, two. So just to remind you, this is a diagonal metric. So raising the index is just multiplying with G one, one. And now we have G one, one, two plus G one, two, one minus G One, two, one. Is it correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. These two components cancel each other out, and we are left with G one one. Um, differentiated with respect to the first component, that will be minus two phi, comma one. So we have one half, one over one minus two phi, minus two phi, one, which is minus phi, one over one minus two phi. Is it correct? Uh, differentiate with respect to two, I'm sorry. G11, one, one. this is zero, this is zero. G11 one, one is this one, and we differentiate with respect to two, I'm sorry. This should be, there should be a two here. And then, assuming that phi is small, we can write that this is gamma differentiated with respect to two. 
And of course, this means that we also know terms like G223. Uh, this metric is symmetric with respect to replacing X, swapping X and Y or X and Z or Z and Y. All spatial components are exactly equivalent. Uh, it's very important when calculating the Christopher symbols and, and any other quantities to spot all the symmetries of this type because it helps you enormously with the calculations. So here we know that if we simply replace the first component, the first spatial coordinate with the second one and the second one with the first one, everything should, should remain the same. So applying this rule over here, we see that this will be minus phi three over one minus two phi, which is phi three with a minus. And we also have gamma three, three, one, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay. That was the painful method, the one where we used explicitly all the coefficients. Uh, we use explicitly uh, the equations for the Christoffel symbols. I told you that there is a simpler one, which is one that usually works better. This will be this one over here. Right. Uh, we use the uh, work. Uh, we use the Lagrangian of the geodesic motion. It has a relatively simple form. You just read off the metric. You take the metric and substitute the x dt squared with t dot squared. The uh, the derivative of t with respect to the parameter, and you do pretty much the same with all other components. Okay, so let's calculate the derivatives, dl with respect to dt. Phi does not depend on t. This is the nice property, so we get minus one plus two phi of x i t dot. We differentiate this with respect to the uh, parameter lambda. We are driving the other Lagrange equations from the previous text. This doesn't depend on, on it does depend on x i, but let's first differentiate this guy. And then on top of that, we've got minus two phi I. This guy depends on x i, and x i's depend on the uh, on lambda times t dot. Right. That's divided. This is the derivative with respect to t dot, and dl over dt is equal to zero, because phi doesn't depend on t, and nothing else does dl over d x i dot. That's, we differentiate for, we differentiate that, we get one minus two phi. So th this x i stands for any of, of these three, x, y, or z. And the derivative is going to be the same. So it makes sense to somehow write symbolically uh, derivative with respect to any of these guys. And what we get here is one minus two phi x i dot, right? There will be a two here, but this cancels off with this one. This is dl over dt dot here, d over d lambda, dl over dx dot i. That's going to be one minus two phi x i double dot plus, and we have to differentiate that. So actually it's a minus two phi k x dot k x dot i. And there is a non-trivial d over dx i over here. Because everything depends on that. So here, the differentiation would hit this thing over here and produce minus two again, 
cancels out with one half over here. So there's minus pi pi t dot squared. The same thing happens here, minus pi pi x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared. Okay, we can write down the Euler Lagrange equations. D over D lambda DL over D T dot minus DL over D T equals to zero. That's after a few substitutions minus one plus two phi T double dot minus two phi dot I X dot I T dot equals to zero. And then we have one minus two phi x i double dot minus two phi k x dot k x dot i. So in the first equation, there was no dl over dt, but here we have no trivial dl over dx i. So this will be plus phi i t dot squared plus phi i x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared equals to zero. Okay, we're almost done. We need to recast these equations in the form t double dot plus something else equals to zero, x double dot i plus something else equals to zero, which means we divide everything by uh, minus one, one plus two phi here, or multiply by this here, and multiply by one over one minus phi here. So the main advantage is that in a sense, you read off immediately all the connection coefficients at once. So, after rewriting the first equation takes this form. One plus two phi x dot i t dot equals to zero. And we've got this equation over here. Minus two phi k over one minus two phi x dot i x dot k. Then we have this thing over here, minus two phi t dot squared plus t i over one minus two phi x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared equals to zero. Okay, and now the trick is simply to read off the gamma coefficients real, realizing that the equation has this form. So, okay, let's do it. Uh, obviously here we have x i dot t dot. So, this will correspond to the i zero gamma coefficients because x dot zero is t dot, x dot i is basically x dot i. However, remember that as we as we noticed before, uh, terms with two different coefficients here come in pairs as zero i and i zero. So a single one that will be gamma zero corresponding to t zero i is going to be half of that, which is phi i divided by one plus two phi. And other components with zero on the top, so corresponding to t double dot, they all vanish. There's only three non-vanishing, these guys. So that was easy. This one will be a little harder. So let's, here we've got coefficients gamma, k, and whatever else. So let's begin with the first case. There's a 
t squared over here corresponding to zero, zero, and that's equal to, well, simply phi k over one minus two phi. I renamed this index from i to k. I shouldn't have, but hmm, that's okay. And then we have terms like gamma k ij. It's best to do it first for the case when they're not equal. If they're not equal, then this thing cannot contribute because we have only the squares of each individual component here, dotted component here, and there is no mixed terms here. There are mixed terms here. And again, uh, we have to make sure that we uh, take only half of that because they always come in pairs as x.1, x.3, and x.3, x.1, and so on. So we got this thing over here for i not equal to j. For i equal to j, let's say i i. Now here we have to be careful. We'll have this minus two phi dot i contribution from here, but we will have the same and, uh, and actually positive contribution from here, right? Because this will, for, for the same, for k equal to a, this will produce two minus two phi i x i squared, and this will produce produce phi dot i x dot square with a positive sign and without a two. So altogether we will get phi dot k over one minus two phi. So this guy, let me draw it here, comes from that and from that guy. Yeah, and the mixed coefficients gamma k o i, these have to vanish, they don't appear. Okay, so I think this is a much simpler form, except that reading off is not all that trivial. You have to be careful and spot each contributions to each terms of this kind from any term here and watch for the signs. Is this clear or are there any questions to this method? Okay, I don't see any. You can check at home that actually you can take, let me use yet another color. You can take this guy and this guy together and write them down in the following way. Gamma I J K is equal to minus delta i j phi k minus delta i k phi j plus phi a delta j k. So that's something to be checked from, from that. Okay, that's layer 10. Let's just write the geodesic equation in these coordinates. That's actually quite interesting. So we know that gamma i zero zero, that's phi i over one minus two phi. And for very small potentials, this is basically phi i. Uh, and gamma i, okay. We assume that the four velocity of, of our body is basically one and something very small. So vi is much smaller than one. So at the leading order, the spatial part of the geodesic equation is basically gamma i. And the leading order part comes from the zero, zero component, which is one much larger than the component related to v. For a stationary body at the moment, there is no component over here. X dot zero, X dot zero. This is more or less one. So this is basically zero. So X double dot I plus phi I equal to zero or X double dot I is equal to minus phi I. And we recognize the equation for motion, equation of motion of a particle in a 
Newtonian potential. Provided that phi is small and we can neglect the uh, denominator here and provided that the motion is also very slow and we only need to care about the zero component of the, of the four velocity right here. Okay, so at least the geodesic equation in this metric looks indeed like something out of Newtonian physics. We'll later explore this metric a little bit during this lecture, but that should be enough for now. Any questions to the geodesic equation? Okay, there probably isn't any, so I think it's a good time for a break. Let me share the screen again. And let's meet again at 10.04. Thank you, it's, it's time for break. Okay, so hello everyone. It's four minutes past 10, we begin our lecture. It's time for a slides lecture. So last time, if I remember correctly, we discussed the notion of of a connection and of a metric connection that was the the main thing uh, now it's time to go a step further and now we will discuss the Riemann tensor one of most important uh, notions of differential geometry okay we are back here the geodesics so what is the Riemann curvature tensor? Uh, in short, it's a tensor, it's, a, it's, a, it's an object which measures the local difference between, the, between a completely flat space-time and the space-times we have in a coordinate invariant way. Uh, so uh, if you remember, uh, in every space-time we can find locally flat coordinates in which uh, at the leading uh, at the zero and at the first order, the metric looks like in the flat space-time, but you can go beyond that and see how this metric differs from the flat one. And the way to do it in an invariant way is exactly to, to make use of the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, the Riemann tensor is important because it distinguishes flat space-times, so space-times in which we have Cartesian coordinates in which the metric is constant, uh, from more complicated situations. Basically, the Riemann tensor is zero in flat space times exactly and not quite in other space times. It's a tensorial object, somewhat more complicated than the tensors we have encountered so far. It can also be defined in many ways. Uh, and if you go through general relativity or differential geometry textbooks, you'll see many possible definitions of, uh, of the Riemann tensor. However, all of them, uh, one way or another, rely on certain geometric facts, which are true in, in a curved, uh, in a flat space time, but not quite true in a curved one. And then uh, use the, the use that fact to locally to define the curvature. And the Riemann tensor plays a crucial role in GR and in differential geometry in many ways. Uh, we will see in this lecture that it, it has a direct physical interpretation. Um, but at the moment, let, let's just have a look at what it means. So the problem we would like to solve is whether we can distinguish a flat geometry from a non-flat one. And this is not a trivial thing because you, you have realized that it is possible to recast a flat metric, a one that, that is completely constant, in a strange way, just by changing the coordinates. If we pick up very absolutely crazy curvilinear coordinates, the flat metric may look incredibly complicated and it will be very hard to realize that this is actually the flat metric in disguise. So how can we do it? Uh, one possibility is to think about the parallel transport. Uh, in a flat metric, the parallel transport doesn't really depend between two points, doesn't depend really on the path we have taken because the parallel transported vector V uh, at, at the point B is simply in Cartesian coordinates has simply the same components as, as in point A. And this fact doesn't depend on how exactly we perform the parallel transport. It's just that in the Cartesian coordinates, the components of the vector must be the same everywhere in the space-time for the parallel transport. In a curved space, cur space, this is not true anymore. And typically, if we parallel transport a vector from the point A to another point B, remember that we discussed the parallel transport uh, on the previous lecture. We can do it over this curve over here, over this curve, or, or uh, over this curve 
over there. And typically the, the result will be a bit different. So parallel transport is uh, path dependent in a curved space type. And we can somehow use this to define our tensor measuring the deviation from the flatness or, or from the flat space. So let's look at a concrete example. So we have a two dimensional two sphere. I tried to draw it as, as nicely as possible. This is, you can think, simply think about the, the, this being the earth. We assume we've got somebody standing at the point A somewhere along the equator with, a, with an arrow or with the pointers pointing exactly north. Then we imagine this person taking a long journey all the way to the North Pole, all the time making sure that the, the, the pole there, the flag or the, the vector they're carrying points north. Uh, once he or she reaches the North Pole, uh, he or she turns uh, 90 degrees and goes south southwards. But uh, if, if, if this guy is keeping the, the uh, direction of the vector constant, the vector now has to face west, right? Because we're going south uh, along this meridian over here and keeping constant vector means a vector, the vector faces west. And once uh, the, 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 the first person reaches point B, which is basically at 90, again on the equator, but uh, on a, a longitude 90 degrees larger, uh, the vector is pointing west. And we can contrast this to another guy who's carrying, again, a vector which was initially pointing north uh, along the equator. And in this case, a parallel transported vector still faces north. So we, we can clearly see there, there will be a 90 degrees difference here between a parallel transported vector from A to B over the North Pole and the one we have transported along the equator. Uh, this is nice. There, there is a related observation, which is a bit more useful. Namely, if you have just one person who is carrying this vector over the whole loop, consisting of uh, a part of the a meridian over here, part of the meridian over there, and then back along the equator. The resulting vector we carry over the loop will be rotated by 90 degrees, exactly for the same reason. So we can rephrase it, uh, this property in the following way. If we carry and parallel propagate a vector on a, on a curved manifold uh, over a closed loop, it is quite possible that the resulting vector will be different from the one we started from. So the idea to define our local division from flatness is to simply consider a parallel transport over a very small loop uh, around a single point uh, and check if the result of this parallel transport is the, the vector we start from or if there is a small deviation. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, no, I don't think so. Probably not. So let, let, let's have a look at this at the situation uh, in detail in a four-dimensional space-time. So fix a point x naught. We fix a vector v naught, which we will use for the parallel transport, and we fix two vectors x and y, which will define the geometry of this loop over here. So basically, in the first step, we move along this curve, this dark blue curve, which is given by x zero plus x mu sigma where sigma runs, runs from zero to some fixed value delta sigma. So basically we, we walk around the something that would be a straight line in a straight in, in Cartesian coordinates. In these coordinates, it probably isn't, but we don't really care. It's just a curve. Uh, then we go along this slightly lighter curve uh, parameterized by rho from zero to some kind of delta rho. Uh, using the components of the second vector u. Then we do the same over this brighter curve. Uh, this time we go with sigma from delta sigma to zero. And in this last step, we go from delta rho to rho along the curve given again by y. And we are back at the point xo. At each step, we parallel transport our vector v. And in the end, we may find out that the, the result v4 is not quite v0. So in order to quantify this, we have to 
remind ourselves about the parallel transport uh, equations. So the parallel transport is given by an ordinary differential equation, ODE, written over here. It involves the local uh, connection coefficients, the vector field V at a given point, and the momentary tangent vector to the curve we are, we are, we are parallel transporting along. Uh, we can write down the result by integrating this thing over here. Initially, the vector was V0 somewhere over here. And as we parallel transport, we need to integrate this thing over here from zero to some, some delta sigma. Uh, yeah, that's an implicit form of the solution of, of this equation. It's useful because we can use this form uh, to derive a second order Taylor approximation in delta sigma of the parallel transport. So initially we just take the right hand side at the point sigma equal to zero as our first order approximation with the delta sigma over here. And then we can also derive the second order thing by, by repeatedly uh, integrating over here. There's a second order term which is a bit more complicated, but in simply it involves the derivative of gamma at the point sigma zero, uh, the pro two pro products of two gammas, and there is also a second derivative of x beta term over here. All of that evaluated at sigma equal to zero. This gives the second order term, and there are also higher order terms as well. We now go back to our loop, uh, and we plug in this Taylor decomposition we had before. I don't write explicitly the second order term because it's complicated and not really enlightening. And actually in the end, it cancels out as it turns out. Uh, so we, we start from zero, we go to V1 and we use here the values of the coefficients at the point X zero. Uh, now, in order to get to V2 from V1, we need to use the values of the, we use the same equation, but we use the, the, the coefficients gamma, uh, evaluated at one, but we can easily express them by taking the values of the coefficient x zero and the derivative uh, at the leading order at zero. Then we do the same over here. We have the same equation, but this time we have to use gamma at points at point two, which we can then approximate using gamma at point zero and the derivatives of gamma at point zero. So we, we would prefer to express everything in terms of the coefficient, the uh, gamma coefficients, the, the coefficients of the connection at the point zero and its derivatives. And then this is the final step. Uh, now the, the last step is basically to combine all of these equations. So substitute uh, V1 over here with this equation here, substitute V2 right here and V3 of, with, with this equation over here. And with help of that, we should be able to compare V0 with V4. And if you do everything correct and uh, reduce similar terms, check what cancels out, you'll find out that the leading order term is actually quadratic in delta rho, delta sigma. It's the product delta rho, delta sigma. Uh, it consists of the product of V0, our power transported vector, X, Y, which define the geometry of the loop. And there is this strange combination of the gamma, the derivatives of the gamma coefficients of the Christopher symbols at the point x zero and a product of gammas over here. Now, there is a surprising fact about this combination. Namely, it's actually a tensor. And this is very far from obvious. Uh, if you remember the, the Christopher symbols themselves or, or the connection coefficients themselves uh, transform in a rather strange way under coordinate transformations. They, they not only transform by uh, multiplication with the first derivatives of, um, of the uh, functions defining the coordinate transform, they also require an input of the second derivatives, which is very non-tensorial. And the derivatives of gammas actually would require the third derivatives of the functions defining the new coordinates. So in general, this, this thing here should transform in an absolutely ugly way. However, it turns out that this particular combination with these coefficients transforms much nicer, namely it transforms as a tensor. So all the de dependence on, on the second and third derivatives of the functions defining the coordinate transform vanishes 
And this is a nice well-behaved tensor. You can try to prove it directly, but I don't recommend this method. It's actually quite complicated. Uh, it's rather brute force uh, index manipulation thing. We will do it on, during the Blackboard lecture today, later in a, I think, more clever way. Okay, but at the moment, please believe me that this is a tensor, although it does not appear so. So this tensor is known as the Riemann's curvature tensor or the curvature tensor or the Riemann tensor, or in fact, a lot of relativists call it simply the Riemann after a very well-known German mathematician from uh, mid 19th century who defined this quantity. So here's the general expression for the Riemann tensor. It's something you should commit to memory, certainly. It's one of more important equations you learn on this during this lecture. The basic property is that if this thing vanishes on an open set, so not just at a point, but on a larger region of the manifold, then around each point, you can find local coordinates, which are basically Cartesian coordinates. So the metric coefficients are entirely constant. And then you can also use a simple linear transform to make these constant coefficients actually uh, uh, a diagonal representation with plus and minus plus ones and minus ones, if you wish so. So at least locally in the vicinity of every point, it will look like a flat space time, not in the sense of a Taylor series, but simply over a, a set of finite size. It would be great if we could actually assure that you could, we can globally find these coordinates, but this is not guaranteed by, by just vanishing of the Riemann. There are some topological restrictions as well. Uh, there is a related property if this tensor vanishes on an open set, then we can show that the parallel transport is locally independent of path. So uh, at least for curves, which are not, do not deviate very much from our given point, the result of parallel transport between A and B does not depend on which curve we pick. In fact, these two properties are very much related. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, probably not. Okay, in the next step, I would like to derive an equation for the Riemann tensor in locally flat coordinates. Uh, the reason is that uh, in locally flat coordinates, the exact expression is, in terms of the metric tensor is a little bit simpler. So recall that in the locally flat coordinates at a given particular point, uh, the Christoffel symbols are equal to zero or equivalently the metric tensor, uh, the first derivative of the metric tensor, the partial derivatives of its components is equal to zero. And in that case, the equation for the Riemann tensor becomes relatively simple. It's just uh, a combination of the first derivatives of the Christoffel symbols. On the other hand, the Christoffel symbols are given by this expression over here. I'm, use, I'm using a color coding here. So equations which are written in green are equations which are only valid in these local flat coordinates at a given point. They are not universal. The black equations are universal on the other hand. So the green equations hold only at a particular point if we choose coordinates in which gamma vanishes at that point. So we would like to derive an equation for the derivative of gammas in terms of the metric function. Uh, the general expression is rather ugly. I omit here the indices just to make the, the equation a little bit more readable, but it should be pretty clear that this is the inverse metric. It, it is appropriately um, uh, multiplied by the, by the second order derivatives of G. And here we have just the first order derivatives. Now, in locally flat coordinates, obviously the second term is equal to zero because we have first derivatives of the metric. And the equation for the derivative of gamma of the co connection coefficient is, is relatively simple. There is an inverse metric G alpha sigma and in the, uh, in the parenthesis, you've got a combination of the second order derivatives of the metric. Now we can substitute this equation to that one. And after a bit of simplification, we get a relatively simple equation for the Riemann tensor in terms in terms of the of the derivatives of the metric again valid only in locally flat coordinates 
And it becomes even nicer if you lower the first index of the Riemann tensor, which recall we have defined with the first index being up and next three indices being down. Uh, the Riemann tensor is just uh, a combination of four different second derivatives of the metric coefficients. Again, a green formula, so valid only in locally flat coordinates. Okay, so uh, if you remember in locally flat coordinates, the, the, the first derivative of metric was zero, and the second derivative is directly related to the Riemann tensor, something to remember. Now, a very useful property of this formula over here is that you can use it to derive various algebraic properties of the Riemann tensor. So Riemann tensor is, is an object with four indices. In principle, it could, it could have four to the power of four components, which is 256, but it turns out that there is much fewer of them, in fact. Uh, first, it's easy to check that the, the Riemann is anti-symmetric with respect to the first two indices. If you look at this formula over here, it's easy to see that the first and the second term are basically the same terms just with the row of mu and mu reversed, and they come with opposite signs. And the same for the comp component for the term over here and over there. They just differ by the position by swapping of mu and mu. And there again, they come with different signs. So swapping mu and mu will produce just a change of the sign over here. The same happens with the first pair of indices, switch swapping alpha and beta uh, just changes the sign because look, the term number one and the term number four just differ by swapping the row of alpha and beta. Uh, and the same for the term two and three. So there's also that. And moreover, there's a more complicated symmetry of swapping both pairs with each other. So alpha, beta, mu, nu, our alpha beta mu nu is al our mu nu alpha beta. We have changed the order of both pairs. Again, you can check it over here that when you do it, you obtain exactly the same expression. Something a bit more difficult to prove is that if you take the sum of Riemann tensors with appropriate cyclic permutations of the last three indices, so alpha beta mu nu, alpha mu nu beta, alpha nu beta nu, which is, you just take the cyclic permutations of glass three indices, then this sums up to zero. Uh, now all these, we have derived all of these properties in local flat coordinates, but note that these are tensorial equations and tensorial equations, if they're valid in one coordinate system, they must be valid in all of them, simply because both the left and the right hand side transforms as a tensor independently of anything else. And this is very nice. It means that we can prove algebraic properties in local flat coordinates where this expression for the Riemann is relatively simple, but the conclusion will be valid in any coordinates. So these are the properties of the Riemann tensor. Uh, the last one can also be written down this way when, where you use the anti-symmetrization operator. So I introduce here this notation where the square uh, bracket corresponds to taking the uh, one over six and the sum of all possible permutations of the indices with the parity sign taken into account. So this is equivalent to that equation over here. And all these algebraic properties, they mean that the components of Riemann are not independent from each other. And in fact, there's only 20 independence of components in dimension four as opposed to 220, 256, there could be if there were no properties. Uh, we will not perform a proper counting of all the components. If you're curious, I think Schutz has a very nice discussion of where, where this number comes from. Okay. Now, uh, a very important identity. The reason why Riemann tensor pops up very often in, in computations in differential geometry on GR is that it is related to the commutation properties of covariant derivatives. What do I mean? So let's first take a scalar function and I take a second derivative of the scalar function with, with covariant derivatives. Uh, I can do it in two possible orders. 
But for scalars, this doesn't matter. In fact, we have demanded this property uh, when we defined the levi civita or the metric connection. It was supposed to be this way, that the second derivatives of a function with respect to uh, covariant derivatives is supposed to be symmetric. So this commutation, commutation means that we compare uh, one order of operations with the other order of operations. This thing, this commutator should be equal to zero. However, for vectors, it turns out that this is not zero. What appears here on the on the right hand side is simply the Riemann tensor contracted with with our vector x beta uh, in the second index, and the mu nu indices appear at the end. So the indices uh, with respect to which we differentiate, and this also works for covectors, except that we have to take a minus sign and contract with the first index, the one which is upper. And this formula generalizes very nicely to any tensor. Namely, we have that the uh, difference between the two possible orders of uh, differentiations with respect to uh, covariant derivative with respect to alpha and beta. Well, this difference is simply for, an, for a tensor which has upper and lower indices. For each upper index, we, we perform a contraction with the Riemann tensor, uh, with the contraction hitting the second uh, index of the Riemann and the appropriate index of T. Uh, and we take alpha, beta, the differentiation indices over here, and we do it successively for all upper indices. And for lower indices, we have a similar formula, but now we take the Riemann with a minus, and we contract the first upper index with the index we are substituting over here. And this goes again for each index of this tensor here. So this is a very nice formula. It looks very much like the formula for uh, the covariant derivative of a tensor, um, except that here we use the Riemann. Uh, so again, this is a formula that you should remember. It looks ugly, but if you manage to remember the formula for the covariant derivative, then this one is somewhat similar. And it's very important. It will play a big role in, in later lectures. OK, and the last topic regarding the curvature tensor. Oh, is there any question to this commutation property of the Riemann tensor? You have time for questions. OK, there are none. Uh, the next topic I would like to discuss with you is the Bianchi identities. These are identities somewhat similar to the algebraic properties of the Riemann tensor, but not of the Riemann tensor itself, rather of its first derivative. So it turns out that the first covariant derivative of the Riemann is not uh, arbitrary. It has to satisfy an additional algebraic property. And we'll derive it again using the trick with locally flat coordinates. So we've got our expression for the Riemann tensor, again, omitting the indices for brevity. We take the standard partial derivative of each component. We obtain a longer, more complicated version of that. And the derivative may hit each of these uh, objects over here. But in locally flat coordinates, a lot of this mass goes away and we are left with a very simple formula with the second derivatives of gammas uh, appearing only. Okay, so we need to calculate the second derivatives of gammas in terms of the metric. And this is relatively easy. Again, we, we start with the general expression. We differentiate it once. We differentiate it twice. We get this thing over here, which looks complicated. But again, in locally flat coordinates, here we have the first derivative of the inverse metric, which is which is zero in locally flat coordinates. Here we have the first derivative of the metric in locally flat coordinates. This is zero. So only the first term survives. And this is the uh, equation for the second derivative of the Christoffel symbols in terms of metric. It's just given by the third derivatives of the metric tensor. And if we plug it into this thing here, this is the equation for the derivative of the Riemann. It's given by 
again, a strange combination of the third partial derivatives of the metric tensor. Okay. Now in the next step, we show that if we take the uh, cyclic sum, if we sum over cyclic permutations of indices, indices sigma and mu nu, the last two indices, so sigma blah blah mu nu, mu blah blah nu sigma, mu blah blah sigma mu, if we sum it up, this sums up to zero. Uh, this is still a green equation, which is valid only in local flat coordinates, but it's very easy to turn, to turn into a proper tensorial equation. You just have to realize that the standard derivative in local flat coordinates is the covariant derivative at the same time. So we just write the same equation using covariant derivatives. It's equivalent to that one in local flat ones. But again, this is a tensorial equation. If it's valid in some coordinates, it has to be valid in all of them. So we can write it as a black equation valid in any coordinate system. And we've got an identity concerning the first covariant derivative of the Riemann tensor, the Bianchi identity or Bianchi identities. Any questions? Okay, again, no questions. Uh, the Riemann tensor has a lot of indices, as many as four, which means that we can try to perform contractions of these indices and obtain interesting geometric object. Uh, the first thing we will do is to contract the first index with the third one. This way we get an object of valence 0, 2 with two lower indices, and this is called the Ricci tensor. It's a kind of contracted measure of, of curvature. And then using the metric, we can contract these two indices, obtain some kind of R mu mu. This way we obtain a scalar measuring the curvature, and this is known as the Ricci scalar. Uh, these are standard names, and again, they're quite important. Uh, we can go back to the algebraic properties of the Riemann, and it turns out that they imply certain algebraic properties of the Ricci, namely, it has to be symmetric with respect to the first to its two indices. So it's a symmetric tensor of valence zero two. And the Bianchi identities, if you if you if you contract them, if you perform the appropriate contraction. So if you go here and contract the first index with the third one, so alpha with mu consistently everywhere, you will arrive at the following equation. The divergence of the Ricci tensor with respect to the first index, that's basically the gradient of the Ricci scalar with the one half term over here. Uh, you may wonder what happens when you do other contractions of the, of the Riemann tensor. It turns out that there are no other interesting contractions. If you contract the first index with the the second one, this is zero because these indices are anti-symmetric. And also if you contract the third with the fourth, the result is zero because the indices are anti-symmetric. What you could try to do is to contract the first with the fourth or the second with the third or the second with the fourth, but it turns out that you obtain plus or minus the Ricci tensor anyway. So this thing here is the only interesting contraction. All other contractions are either zero or plus or minus this one. So this is all possible contractions of the Riemann. Okay, that's the end of the slides for today. Uh, do you have any questions concerning the Riemann tensor? Okay. Okay, there, are, there, there don't seem to be any. So let's do something else. Let's do the second part of the Blackboard lecture. Uh, I'll stop sharing this screen and I will share the sketchbook. Yes. Okay, so Riemann curvature tensor.
so the first thing I would like to do is to derive the this important uh, identity with the commutation of covariant derivatives of a vector. So here's what it looks like. So we will try to prove that. And we will not only try, we will actually prove that. It's not that difficult. It's just a question, the question of applying the definition of uh, the covariant derivative in an appropriate way. So let's just calculate nabla mu acting on nabla mu x alpha. That's basically nabla mu, nabla mu x alpha, but the bracket here uh, basically emphasizes that we are differentiating a two tensor with one lower index and one upper index. So this is the standard derivative of the components of that one, plus uh, one, oh, let's do it this way, minus the term uh, connected with this new thing. So nabla sigma x alpha plus a term related to this index over here, gamma alpha sigma mu, nabla mu x sigma. I have just applied the definition of covariant derivative. And now in the second step, I apply the definition of the covariant derivative for this for these three terms, for this first covariant derivative of x alpha. So this is the standard partial derivative of components of x alpha plus gamma alpha rho mu x rho minus gamma sigma mu mu again, d sigma x alpha plus gamma alpha rho sigma x rho plus gamma alpha sigma mu. And here we have d mu x sigma plus gamma sigma rho mu x rho. Okay, we differentiate the first term, getting the second partial derivative of the components x alpha plus d nu d nu gamma alpha rho nu x rho plus mm, I will use this one plus d plus gamma alpha rho nu d mu x rho minus gamma sigma mu mu d sigma x alpha minus gamma sigma mu mu gamma alpha rho sigma x rho plus gamma alpha sigma mu d mu x sigma plus gamma alpha sigma mu, gamma sigma rho mu x rho. Okay, this is our result. And now what are we actually calculating? We're calculating the anti-symmetrization of this expression with respect to mu nu. It turns out that not all of these terms here will survive that because some of the expressions are symmetric or they have counterparts which make them symmetric. Let me change colors to make it a bit more explicit. So this guy is two covariant derivatives with respect to um, mu and nu. So this is when we take the anti-symmetrization, this is going to be equal to zero. It cancels out with, with, with the appropriate term from this guy over here. Uh, 
this thing over here, let me use a different color. This thing over here and this thing over here. You see, they only differ in the end by the position of U and U and the name of the summation index, but we can always change that. So they make this, so the sum of these two expressions is symmetric with respect to mu and nu. So these things will again cancel out when we perform the anti-symmetrization. So let's take this color now. Uh, this guy is obviously symmetric with respect to mu and nu because the Christopher symbols are symmetric with respect to that. And so is this one. So it will not survive either. And in, in, the, in the end, only two terms have survived. This one here and this one here. So let's write it here, survives. This one also survives. And let's now write down what we obtain. Gamma alpha rho mu x rho minus the same thing here. And we also have the product part. Minus the same with the indices swapped. And now we can uh, take our X, X row from the expression and leave everything else in brackets. And what we are left with is gamma alpha sigma nu gamma sigma rho nu minus gamma alpha one gamma sigma rho nu times x rho, and that's the curvature tensor. Okay, mission accomplished. We have proved this identity. Any questions? Probably none. This was by the way, layer 11. So now we will use this result to prove that Riemann is indeed a tensor. This is not obvious from, from the general expression, but it turns out that if you have this identity over here, which is supposed to be valid in any coordinate systems and for any vector field X, this sort of, this becomes relatively easy to prove. So this thing here is given by this appropriate combination of the first derivatives of gamma and, and, and the product of gammas. But also we know that this holds for any vector field X, any point P and any coordinate system. This is for all. So we can write down the same identity in a different coordinate system. Let's say the one with a bar. Again, the bar simply means that we are using 
uh, this is in a different coordinate system. So we've got some kind of X alpha but X of X beta. Uh, okay, but all of these guys, X beta and second derivatives certainly transform like a tensor. So we have, uh, so these guys are just lambda mu mu bar, lambda mu mu bar, lambda alpha bar alpha. I'm just using the fact that the covariant derivative produces tensors. So this is equal to R alpha bar, beta bar, mu bar, mu bar, lambda, beta bar, beta, x, beta. Okay. This thing here is obviously uh, the Riemann in our previous coordinates from this thing here. Uh, so what we get is R alpha beta mu mu x beta. I will just multiply everything with the inverse lambda matrices or the lambda matrices just, just to bring them to the other side. So what I get is that this is lambda mu bar mu, lambda mu bar mu, lambda alpha alpha beta, this is equal to R alpha beta, beta bar mu bar mu bar, lambda beta bar beta, x beta. This is supposed to be valid for all possible x beta. And this simply means that this has to be valid component by component because otherwise we, we could find x beta for which these guys would be different. So we get basically our transformation law, although here it is a transformation from the uh, co com components with, with a bar to the components without, without a bar. But it's easy to invert this transformation by multiplying everything by uh, some kind of inverse, um, let's say alpha gamma bar, lambda beta delta bar, etc. If you do it, you obtain the standard transformation law. Okay, so we have basically proved that our that our tensor obeys. Sorry obeys the standard transformation law for tensors, despite being made of objects which by themselves behave rather strange under coordinate transforms. Any questions to the proof? Okay, I don't see any questions. This is, by the way, a very common uh, way of proving things in differential geometry. Uh, you show that they can be defined in terms of purely tensorial quantities. So uh, R here, in this formula, R uh, takes a vector and produces something that is also a tensor. And something that takes a vector and produces a tensor must be a tensor itself. With a bit of a different formulation of the theory of tensors, this would be enough to, to prove that this is a tensor, but we were defining tensors as, as objects which obey a transformation law of, of, a, of a kind. So we have to do a little bit of calculations to see that this is indeed the case if this identity holds. Okay, we have something like 10 more minutes and I have prepared the first uh, calculation or exercise. This is calculating the the Riemann tensor of a two sphere. So basically a sphere of dimension two. We have calculated the Christoffel symbols for this, uh, for this manifold. We call that the metric is something like this. 
Mm, yeah, so we've got coordinates theta phi. Mm, the inverse metric is very simple because it's diagonal. So here we have one over sine squared theta. Uh, regarding the Christoffels, in dimension two, there's only six possible Christoffels because we are free to choose the, the index over here and there's two of them. Uh, and here the expression has to be symmetric. It has to be a symmetric a two by two matrix and symmetric two by two matrices, but there's only three of them. So the number is six. There are six independent Christopher components, Christopher symbols. We have calculated that the only non vanishing ones are gamma one to two, which is minus sinus sine theta cos theta, and gamma two one two, which is the same as gamma two to one, is the cotangent of theta. Everything else is zero. Okay, so the as the task is now to calculate the Riemann tensor for the geometry. Let's first think how many independent components Riemann has in dimension two. So we've got the R, A, B, C, D, the lowercase Riemann tensor. And what do we know about it? Well, we know that whenever we repeat an index in the first or in the second pair, this will be zero because there is anti-symmetry here. So we must have two different indices here and two different indices here. But that's equal to minus R2112, which is equal to minus R1221, which is equal to plus R2121. which is equal to, yeah. And that's all possibilities. There is no other non-vanishing possible Riemann tensor components. So in the end, just one independent component. In principle, it could be two to the power of four, which is six, which is 16 independent components, but the algebraic properties of anti-symmetry with respect to the first index and of the second index at the symmetry of uh, exchanging the pairs, it reduces everything just to one component because you can express every non-vanishing one just with R1 to 1, 2. Uh, is it clear? Okay, I expect, I suppose so. So we are just supposed to calculate R2, 1, 2, which is equal to R1, 2, 1, 2, simply because raising and lowering the first index is free. There is no coefficient here. The coefficient is one. So G11 one, one with lower indices is one, G11 one, one with upper indices is one. So there's no difference here. And this is D1 gamma, one, uh, let's write it down, this is gamma one, two, two, minus D, two, gamma one, two, one, plus gamma one, A, one. I'm just applying the uh, standard formula for the Riemann. Gamma A to one. Okay. Uh, this thing over here is obviously zero. Because there is no mixed components here. This one is not zero. Out of this thing here, uh, which components survive? Uh, so 
there is one 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 which which vanishes, or the, or there's one two one which also vanishes. So all components appearing here vanish. So this is also equal to zero. We are left with this one here. We have gamma one two two gamma one to one. Uh, gamma one to one doesn't contribute anything, so it's zero. But there's also possibility of gamma one to two gamma two to one. Oh, and that that one works. So there is a non-zero contribution from minus gamma one to two gamma two to one. Uh, this thing here is just the derivative with respect to theta of the one to two component, which is minus sine theta cosine theta. And here we get minus gamma one to two, which is minus sine theta cosine theta times gamma two to one, which is cotton theta. Here we will get minus cosine theta squared plus sine squared theta. And here we'll have a plus and a cosine squared theta, which reduces to sine squared theta. So this is not a flat space time. This is not, this is not a flat manifold. There is a non-vanishing sine squared theta uh, component. Uh, okay. In the next lecture, we'll also calculate the Ricci scalar and the uh, Ricci tensor for this metric, but this is enough for today. Do you have any questions? Okay. If not, then thank you very much. And well, see you next week. Goodbye.